When it comes to corruption, we're talking misconduct, malfeasance, abuse of power, etc. The single most important concept to understand is compartmentalization, which is best described as layers of need to know, just like they have in the military. Within an organization or agency or group or network of any kind, the people above you may be keeping some information from you so that you only have part of the truth, or they could be giving you some truth mixed in with some lies, or they could be lying to you completely. Even then, those people above you are in the exact same situation. They may tell you things that they believe are true without knowing that they're being lied to by the people who are above them, and so forth. As they say, a fish rots from the head down. This describes top-down compartmentalization from the leadership level down to the ground level, but there is also lateral compartmentalization where there's lying and withholding and invisible lines between individuals regardless of their place in the pecking order. Last but not least is willful ignorance, where someone with authority can tell the people underneath them that they don't want to know any details about what's going on so that they can maintain plausible deniability. All three of these types of compartmentalization can work in tandem with each other. In this way, lies can pass from person to person across all levels like a virus without each person knowing that they're infected with those lies. In a corrupt structure, the number of people who know the whole truth is usually kept to a minimum. Compartmentalization allows for a whole spectrum of different archetypes or types of people that maintain the corrupt structure. The spectrum goes from unwitting participants that are not necessarily corrupt themselves all the way to those who are the most corrupt and have the worst intentions. We can call this the spectrum of corruption, and the types of people at each band of the spectrum can be called corruptoids. The first band of the spectrum is manipulation. These are people who simply do not know what is really going on because they are being lied to and or used. They may be good, honest people or not, but by definition, they are not part of the inner circle. They are the outer circle. They may believe that they're in the know simply because they're part of the organization, but they're being misled or misled, which makes them a perfect first line of defense for the corrupt structure. When we're talking truth versus lies, the manipulated are like a human moat. For example, if someone outside the organization makes an accusation against the organization that is actually true, the manipulated can deny it with full confidence because they actually believe what they're saying. Oh, trust me, there's no corruption here. If there was, I would know about it. The second band of the spectrum is loyalty. This is where people are unwilling to speak up or act against their colleagues to varying degrees and for a few different reasons. Some are loyal to their colleagues on a personal level, some are loyal to the organization as a whole, some are loyal to their own paychecks, and some are simply under the influence of social pressure and don't want to be the one to rock the boat and cause trouble. Some have knowledge of corrupt activity within the organization but just don't say anything about it, while others don't want to know and choose to turn a blind eye. Within the organization, loyalty creates a bridge between those who have dirty hands and those who do not. However, it's important to understand that some loyalists are willing to keep heavier secrets than others, and some have a breaking point past which they will no longer keep secrets. In some cases, people can be coerced into maintaining loyalty. Next is bribery, the third band of the spectrum and the first form of coercion. These are people who are willing to participate in the corrupt activity in exchange for payment of some kind, whether it's money, favors, goods and services, illicit sex, vices, or whatever. These can be people who have some authority within the organization, as well as ground-level people who are aware of the corrupt activity. Essentially, they are selling their power, their resources, their access, their influence, or, at the ground level, their silence. Their cooperation is for sale. We have extortion. These are people that are being forced to participate in corrupt activity by way of threats of any kind, whether it's a threat to destroy someone's social or personal life, a threat to destroy their livelihood, or a threat of violence. At extremes, this can include threats against the person's loved ones. These people have been sent a strong message. Play ball or else. Fifth on the spectrum is blackmail. This is one of the most powerful forms of coercion. These are people who have secrets of their own, while proof or evidence of those secrets is in the hands of someone else. These secrets can range from embarrassing to illegal. You can have a person who did something illegal or socially unacceptable in the past, uncover proof of it, and then use that material as leverage against them. Or, you can manipulate a person into committing a crime or getting into a bad situation, then create proof of that event through some kind of recording, photos, video, audio, whatever, and then use that material. A less effective method would be to create fake material and use it. In essence, to possess legitimate blackmail material on a person is to possess a part of that person that can be used to destroy the rest of that person. Also, systemic blackmail can be used within sophisticated criminal groups as a means of initiation and security so that every member of the criminal group is forced to maintain loyalty. If the creation of blackmail material is required to become part of the group, then nobody can ever betray the group without suffering severe consequences. This may be referred to as a system of mutually assured destruction. Finally, we have psychopathy. These are the people who do the manipulation, the bribery, the extortion, the blackmail of the others. Blue collar or white collar, they're human predators. Here, a psychopath is loosely defined as a person who has little or no empathy and a willingness to commit crimes against other people, but their drives and motives can vary widely. 
Psychopaths have a spectrum of their own, from the career street criminal who may directly commit acts of violence with his own hands, to the high-status white-collar criminal who can hurt people simply by making decisions and giving orders. From the assassin who's only loyal to his paycheck, to the radical extremist who's loyal to some greater cause. They can be very cunning, conniving, deceptive, and manipulative, and since they're willing to do whatever it takes to get what they want, they often make their way into positions of power, which enables them to coordinate corrupt activity with each other. Psychopaths attract psychopaths. So, to recap, the spectrum of corruption goes manipulation, loyalty, bribery, extortion, blackmail, psychopathy. Now that you understand the spectrum itself, the important thing to recognize is that all of these archetypes overlap on each other. Each of these bands of the spectrum of corruption blends into the next, and all of these elements can be present to some level or another, in some combination or another, within one person. A person can be loyal because they are bribed while also being manipulated. Psychopaths can manipulate each other as well as bribe, extort, or blackmail each other. Psychopaths can sometimes be loyal to each other, so on and so forth. Let's look at a quick example. Here you have three ground-level people who are totally in the dark about the corrupt activity going on above them, so they're being manipulated and are also loyal. There's one more ground-level person who knows things the others don't, but we'll come back to that. The next level up, everyone knows part of the truth about what's going on in the organization, so they know more than the people below them, but they're also being manipulated and are also loyal. Above them are two people who are loyal and are being bribed, but one of them knows the whole truth about what's going on and the other one doesn't, which puts a divide between them. Maybe one of them has more of a conscience than the other, and so is not trusted with all of the secrets. Whether they're morally okay with the corrupt activity or not, what they have in common is the fact that their extra paychecks are good enough to keep them quiet and compliant. Now, the person that knows the whole truth just so happens to be personally friends with someone on the ground level, and through their relationship, some information about the corrupt activity is divulged to the person on the ground. This gives the upper level person an extra pair of eyes and ears that can be used to advantage. At the top is not a psychopath, in this case, just someone who is being blackmailed, which forces his loyalty, and his blackmailers give him a little extra money on the side for his trouble, which is a bribe. He takes his orders from an external psychopath who was at the top of his own pyramid. This explains how corruption can work in the hypothetical sense, but identifying corruption in the real world requires a multifaceted understanding. You have to understand the human mind, especially human thought, so that you can understand human behavior, while also having the strength of reasoning to consider multiple possibilities at the same time. You have to be able to modulate or shift perspective and look at everything from multiple angles with different combinations of variable factors, all while suspending judgment. You have to understand hierarchy and circumstance in relation to the human element, which is where the spectrum of corruption fits in. You have to stop thinking about people and situations as hypothetical, because we don't live in a world, we live in the world. Corruption falls under the category of crime, which falls under the category of human behavior, where the truth is something that is discovered, not calculated in a hypothetical intellectual vacuum. Forget the idea of a person and think in terms of the person, the company, the CEO, the government agency, the police officer, etc. Recognize everything that you don't know and never lose sight of it. The map is not the territory. In a battle between truth and lies, the battleground is the human mind. In order to strengthen our ability to navigate through lies and arrive at the truth, we have to strengthen our understanding of the mind and the way it handles information. Human consciousness is a huge and complex subject that is approached differently by different schools of thought, but for our purposes, we'll narrow our focus to a few key components. A triad of cognition, language, and perspective, each of which influences the other two. Cognition, in the simplest sense, is human thought. Language is an intellectual tool of communication that also gives us units of meaning. Perspective is a mental sense of vantage point, or point of view. Let's break these down further. Unfortunately, human cognition is not perfect and is vulnerable to all sorts of influence. Cognitive dissonance can be described as a psychological sense of unease or tension that is experienced when two or more contrary ideas or pieces of information are held in mind at the same time. Now, dissonance is the opposite of consonance. Things that are dissonant clash with each other, while things that are consonant mesh or agree with each other. A simple analogy can be found in music. Musical notes that work together are consonant, and this is how harmony is formed. Notes that don't work together are dissonant and often unpleasant to the ear. When faced with dissonance, the mind has a sort of urge to resolve the tension, and the simplest way to do that is to remove the dissonant note. Think of pieces of information that we use to form beliefs as musical notes. You have what you currently think, and are met with a piece of information that agrees with it. This is consonant to your mind and bolsters your certainty of that belief. But then, here comes a piece of information that contradicts the belief, leaving you in an uncomfortable state of dissonance. So you either reject the information, or find some way to shift it or reinterpret it into something consonant. 
In the simplest terms, cognitive biases are tendencies or inclinations in human thought where a person's thinking is biased in one way or another that is not truly logical. By default, the mind wants to take the path of least resistance, and since cognitive dissonance is a source of tension, it propels us toward bias. Let this ball represent a person's cognition, and the line represents thought process. Now we're going to add a factor. Gravity. When the ball reaches the intersection, it can either move upward, embracing the challenge of uncertainty and enabling the formation of a new belief, or it can move down, taking the path of least resistance. <laughs> this gravity is cognitive bias. Researchers have identified several inborn cognitive biases, but here are just two examples. Confirmation bias is the tendency to seek out and interpret information in a way that confirms our existing beliefs. The mind craves certainty and avoids that which is dissonant in favor of that which is consonant. It functions like a default subconscious assumption that your current beliefs are probably correct and anything contrary is probably not. Cognition is also biased toward things that are more readily available in memory or things that are already familiar to the mind. It's easier for the mind to think that it's looking at another instance of something it already understands than to develop a new piece of understanding. In a way, we interpret reality through experience-colored glasses as though it's somehow more likely that we already understand than that we don't. Last but not least, cognition can be heavily influenced by emotion. Language is made up of words, and words are units of meaning. Language is like a mesh of invisible lines that divides our raw human experience into distinct components so that we can identify and differentiate between this and that, here and there, then and now, up and down, and so on. Because words are units of meaning, we can easily confuse them for being a source of meaning as though words are the building blocks of thoughts, as though our thoughts are merely a selection of the right words in the right sequence. However, human thought gave rise to human language, not the other way around. Words are just symbols that represent or describe real-life things in an abstract, hypothetical way. As we covered in Volume 1, a person is hypothetical. The person is real. The symbol represents the real thing. It does not define the real thing. Words and numbers have a key similarity and a key difference. Both are symbols that represent values and are strung together so that they can be computed. With words, we create statements, questions, etc. With numbers, we create expressions and equations. The key difference is that the values of numbers are concretely defined while the meanings of words are not. Math is exact while language is fluid. Let's look at an equation. 2 plus 3 equals 5. As long as 2 is this and 3 is this, 2 plus 3 will always equal this, which is known as 5. But what if you redefine 3 as this? Then the conclusion would be false. This way of reassigning value is something that words are susceptible to, especially considering that words can already mean different things in different contexts and can evolve over time. It's almost like words are crowd surfing on our collective consciousness. This is why it's helpful to think of words like algebraic variables. In algebra, equations can be qualified by specifying the way the variables are defined. We say, where x equals 2, y equals 5. It's just like saying if. If x equals 2, then y equals 5. In the context of language, just like in algebra, whether or not a given statement is true is totally dependent on the definitions of the words, or variables, that are used. When we use variables to build our thoughts, our thoughts can be manipulated through the manipulation of those variables if we don't keep track of how they're being defined. As an example, many words and phrases carry connotations, which are cultural or emotional associations, generally positive or negative. These connotations are invoked when the words and phrases are used, creating a subtle secondary layer of meaning which can steer our interpretation of the message. With all of this combined, language has the power to cage the mind. Or, more appropriately, the mind can cage itself with language without realizing that the cage is imaginary. Language is both a powerful tool and a crutch. Failure to recognize language for what it is and use it wisely will lead us astray. Between cognition, language, and perspective, language is the only one that can truly enter our minds from the outside because it's the only one that is transmissible. Perspective is the most complex part of the triad and can be broken down into multiple levels that correspond with the five W's. Who, what, where, when, and why. Three-dimensional perspective is a sense of objects in 3D space. Who, what, where. Four-dimensional perspective is a sense of objects in 3D space over time. Time gives us a sense of motion, or sequence. Who did what, where, and when? What was the sequence of events? The fourth dimension is the axis of time. 
Five-dimensional perspective is a sense of objects in 3D space over time alongside the human element, which encompasses internal mental factors like the awareness, motive, feelings, etc. of the persons involved. Why did who do what, where, and when? What internal human factors contributed to the external sequence of events? The fifth dimension is the axis of cognition. Our sense of perspective can be defined as the capacity to identify the contributing factors or moving parts that created the circumstances and the sequence by which they converged and led to your perceiving them. 5D perspective is an understanding of physical and mental circumstances in space and sequence. Perspective has a unique importance because it determines the orientation of a person's thoughts about a given thing. Perspective influences the starting point of cognition. This outlines the cognition-language-perspective triad. Cognition determines our use of language, just as language shapes our cognition. Cognition determines our interpretation of perspective, while perspective determines the orientation of our cognition. Language conveys a sense of perspective, just as perspective determines the way we think about language.